Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter number 10. Uh, this is a very familiar portion of Scripture to most of you, I am sure. And uh, we'll look at it for just a little bit today. It's a blessed, blessed passage of Scripture. Notice, if you will, verse number 1, Romans chapter 10. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Now, that's the problem with everybody, isn't it? Not just Jews, and he's writing to the Jews. He's talking about the people of Israel desiring that they would be saved, but he said they try to establish their own righteousness. And that's true in our day, isn't it? A lot of folks think that by religion or good works or mass or whatever religious exercise they go through, that that's going to make them right with God, but it does not. We have to submit ourselves under the righteousness of God. For Moses, verse 5, describeth the righteousness which of the law, that the man which doeth those things should live by them. But the righteousness, righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. In other words, faith, true faith, says and talks like this. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? And notice the added commentary. When you see a parenthesis in your Bible, that means a divine commentary. The Holy Spirit is saying more. Now, I would ask you something. The Jews, did they believe that Jesus was the Son of God? No, they did not. They rejected him. Ultimately, they crucified him. They did not believe that he was the Son of God come down to the earth. So notice what it says. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. The Jews looked at it and said, you know what? Jesus did not come down from above. And so the heart that has that lack of faith in Christ, it's still searching for the Messiah to come. And notice he says in verse number 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here is the crowning verse, verse number 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a wonderful verse, isn't it? I pray the Holy Spirit might help us this morning as we Look at this scripture. Paul talks about the word of faith that we preach in verse number 8. And uh, I guess I would uh, think at it like this this morning. Great words of faith. Great words of faith. And uh, I would remind us all that when looking in Romans chapter 10, we should not take it out of its context. We should always read Romans 9, 10, and 11 together. Romans chapter 9 deals with Israel's past and all the blessings that God blessed Israel with above all nations of the earth. God gave them covenants, God gave them promises, God gave them commandments, and ultimately God gave them Christ. And so Romans chapter 9 talks about some of their Old Testament history and how good God has been to Israel. And He's talking in chapter number 10 about Israel's present or the present day. Now we know this, that a Jew is saved today just like we Gentiles are saved. And that is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Since they rejected him as their Messiah, that put them at a great disadvantage, doesn't it? Of coming into faith. And even to this day, a lot of Jewish people do not believe that Jesus 
was the Son of God. They say he was a great prophet, a great teacher, and a great man who God was with, no doubt, did many miracles and wonders, but they would reject him as being the Son of God. And so, well, what happened to Israel? Well, God judicially blinded Israel in part when they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. God then turned to the Gentiles, opened the door of faith to Gentiles, and for nearly 2,000 years now, we've been in what we call the church age. And a lot of it is made up by Gentiles, a Gentile bride of Christ. So where does that leave the Jews? Just because he's born a Jew, does that leave him at a disadvantage? Not nationally, but religiously it does. For the Jews' religious teaches that Christ did not come and that he was not the Savior of the world. But the fact that they're a Jew nationally or because of their race that does not exclude them from salvation today and uh, this scripture points that out very clearly that when believing on Christ you must believe that he is the son of God that he died for you that he was buried and rose again the third day and whosoever whether he be Jew or Gentile that calls on the name of the Lord can be saved and then of course Romans chapter number 11 talks about Israel's future. Some say that God is finished with the nation of Israel. Uh, since they rejected Christ and crucified him, God is never going to deal with them again. But Paul asks the question, has God cast away his, for, uh, his people which he foreknew? And that means Israel. Has God cast them away? And the answer is God forbid. But at the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to come back in power and great glory, and the nation of Israel will be saved at that time. And they'll receive at that time all the land that God promised to Abraham. And during the millennial kingdom, they'll move into that land, and they'll enjoy the blessings that they could have had had they obeyed God in Old Testament times. So I'm glad God has a plan of salvation. God has a word of faith that he wants to share with all people. And I'm glad that I don't just have to say that Israel is included here in Romans chapter 10. I'm glad Gentiles are as well. Boy, what hope we have in Christ. The word of faith which we preach. First of all, I want to say this, it is a wide word. And I want to concentrate on verse number 13. A wide word for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That is a wide word. You can go anywhere on planet earth and preach this gospel and it will find an audience. Because it is a whosoever will. It is a wide word that takes in every nationality, every creed, every religion, every race, every gender, and every class on earth is included in this wide word. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'll tell you, God loved the world. I believe that when Jesus died, he died for the sins of the world. He is a propitiation, John said, not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. I reject this thought that Jesus died for just a select group of people, but I believe that he died for a whosoever will, and it takes in everybody. The gospel is a wide word to all. And uh, somebody said, well, if I could just see my name in the Bible, then I'd believe. I'd rather have the word whosoever will in there than to see my very own name in that book. Somebody said, well, whosoever, how do you know that includes me? Because you're a whosoever. <laughs> Some of you folks that go and sign up for Social Security, you know, you got to prove that you're who you are. They say, do you have a birth certificate? <laughs> Well, here I am, honey. I'm standing in front of you. But they want the piece of paper, don't they? I remember years ago, I was up in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was preaching up there. And uh, they had a big old thick phone book. That was back when they had phones in motel rooms. And, you know, they had big old thick phone books. And I looked at that, and I was amazed by that. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder if there's any Hudson's here. And I turned in that book, and I looked at his page after page after page. And I said, wonder if there's any Don Hudson's in this book. And I looked, and to my amazement, there's about two or three dozen Don Hudson's found in that phone book in Baltimore, Maryland. 
And I thought about that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of them, aren't there? Now, I want to tell you what the old devil would say. If I could read my name here in verse number 13, for if Don Hudson would call upon the name of the Lord, he'd be saved. And I read that in the Bible. You know what the old devil would say? Well, how do you know it's talking about you? The old devil tries to make you doubt your salvation. He tries to make you doubt if there was ever a man named Jesus who lived, lived and died on this earth for your sins. When you get saved, the old devil will try to beat you to death with doubt. He'd say, well, you didn't say the right thing. Your salvation does not depend on what you say. Your salvation depends upon your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, it's funny, isn't it? We don't doubt that uh, there was a man by the name of Abraham Lincoln who was the 16th president of the United States. Well, how do we know that? Well, the history books tell us so. There's monuments to him. There's a lot written about him. But uh, the devil never says, well, you know, that's probably a figment of somebody's imagination. There really wasn't Abraham Lincoln. The devil don't utter, ever do that. But where he will tempt you is to doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. And so... Uh, it is, but it's a wide word. It is a whosoever will word, and I'm glad for that. And you know, say, well, uh, do you believe in that there is an election according to the foreknowledge of God? I sure do, and I believe there is an elect number of people that are going to be saved. But God did not tell me who that is. I say to all men, if you're willing to call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved, you will be saved if you'll do that. But you see, he doesn't leave me. All I have is a whosoever will gospel. And because I believe there are some people that are elected to be saved, then I preach a whosoever will gospel. See, part of it's the divine side. And God takes care of that, the Holy Spirit. And God knows all about that. Jesus paid for their sin. I don't know who that is. And I'm to preach a whosoever will gospel. And our church is a whosoever will gospel church. And if we ever cease to be that as a church, I want to say this, we'll dry up and we'll die. You have a responsibility to witness to everybody that you see knowing that they're a candidate for salvation. It's a wide word. Jesus Christ loves the world. Anywhere you go and you see little kids, God loves those children. Anywhere you go and you see people that may be living a wicked life, I want to say that Jesus died for that person. As unlovely and as unlovable as they may seem, I'm glad that God loves them. It's a wide word, this whosoever will. And then, Notice this, it is a willing word as well for whosoever. Notice this, shall call upon the name of the Lord. How is it that when you preach the gospel, people have a front up, they have their defenses up. And uh, they say, well, you know, that Jesus stuff and that church stuff, you know, I don't really seem to fit and that's, that's really not for me. And yet isn't it amazing how that, when they hear the word of God preached and they find out people ain't just trying to sell them a bill of goods, that they're really concerned about them, when they begin to hear that Jesus went to the cross and died for them. Isn't it amazing how the Holy Spirit takes that word? And I don't understand this. This is a miracle. But he takes that word and the Holy Spirit bursts faith into the heart of a man who says, I will not believe and begins to work on them and just soften them up and the gospel uh, creates faith in them. Willing word, whosoever shall call. I've seen people say, well, that's not for me. I, I'm not going to get saved and be kind of adamant about it. You better be careful with that. But you know what? I've seen those same people, I mean, get under conviction and that person who was one time antagonistic toward the church, antagonistic toward the gospel, somehow their heart begins to melt, and the Holy Spirit works on them, and they get saved. They are made willing to ask the Lord to save them. I tell you, it's a willing word. Holy Spirit softens it up, makes us willing 
to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I don't think God forces anybody to be saved, but I know how it worked in my life. I felt like I was being forced and compelled to come to Christ. I could have resisted. I suppose that I could have. And I know there's a lot of controversy around those kind of things in this hour. But I'll tell you something, Holy Spirit made me want to get saved. When he begins to convict you and deal with you, he shows you just how rotten and how terrible you are. And any excuse you put up, say, well, everybody else is doing it. And Holy Spirit said, I ain't talking to everybody else. I'm talking to you. You see, in every excuse that we bring up as to why we cannot be saved, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us and cut off every avenue of escape or excuse for living like we live. Boy, that's the blessed Holy Spirit. You know, we call him the comforter, and he is that. But I want to say this, he is a great discomforter as well. Once the Holy Ghost starts working in your heart, you won't sleep as good at night because you're thinking about what that preacher said, and more than that, you're thinking about where you go when you leave this world. You're not right with God. And that troubles you. And I want to tell you what that is. That's not just you thinking that. That's the Holy Spirit helping you to be willing to call upon the name of the Lord. Willing word. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Through his work, men are made willing. How do you call on the name of the Lord? You call on the name of the Lord by prayer. I think being saved is as simple as, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, that's easy, and that's simple to do that. You can do that anywhere. You can do that in your home. You can do that in your pew. You can do it in this altar. And I don't care where you are. You can be saved, but you have to be willing to call upon the name of the Lord. Heard of a doctor several years ago that knocked on a patient's door invited in and the doctor went in and made small talk with the man for just a moment and he said well I've got bad news and said I've got good news and the man said well doc said I I want the bad news first and what is it and that man that doctor said to that man who was a Christian doctor he said sir he said you've got six months to live and you have a terminal disease in your body and you're gonna die the man thought about that for a little bit, and he said, well, Doc, he said, what in the world is the good news? He said, the good news is you've got six months in which to prepare to meet God. You say, Brother Don, do you believe in deathbed repentances? I don't think you ought to wait to get on your deathbed to repent of your sins. I know a man who was hanging on a cross that on his deathbed, he asked God for mercy, and it was granted to him. But you know, in one sense of the word, Whenever we get saved, we're on our deathbed. I got news for you. Every one of us are going to die. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment, we are on our deathbed. Do not delay, but willingly come to the Lord Jesus today. It is a willing word. And then this word of faith that we preach is not only a willing word, but it's a wise word as well. For whosoever shall call upon... The name of the Lord, the name of the Lord, a wise word indeed. You'd be foolish to ask the preacher to save you. You'd be foolish to think that the church could save you or any religious denomination or any religious work that you could do. But I want to say this, when you come to the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, you're in the right and only neighborhood to find salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than that name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Baptist cannot help you come judgment day, but Jesus Christ can, and he must. A wise word. I like what the Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2, talking about how Christ was willing to humble himself and leave the heights of glory to come down to the depths of the earth, to the lowest of the low, being made no more than a slave. And he became obedient unto death, and not just any death, but the shameful, shameful death of the cross. 
But I want to say he was placed in the ground as the son of God. And on the third day he arose as a victor over that grave. And the Bible says that God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Boy, I'm talking about a wise word when you call upon the Lord to save you. Acts 16 and verse number 31, uh, the Philippian jailer came in and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Fixing to take his own life. Paul said, listen, said, do thyself no harm. We're all here. And then he makes the great statement, whosoever believeth in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. What shall I do to be saved? And the answer was simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Wise, wise word. Now let me encourage you, if you've never done that, you need to do it. And you need to do it today. You don't need to wait. You need to get saved today. And settle that in your heart. Don't make it any harder than it is. It is simple. And you don't have to have a preacher present. You don't have to have anybody there. Now, it's good to. I think you ought to pray, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Just say simply, God, I know I'm in the wrong. And I know I need help. And uh, I know that I'm just coming to you in simple faith. Fix me up, Lord. Save me by your grace. And then get up and thank God for it and start living for the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, I'm afraid that I can't live it. Well, you can't. That's the way it, plain and simple. You can't live it. But the Holy Spirit will move in you and he'll teach you when you're wrong. You do something wrong, the Holy Spirit will speak to you about that. No two ways about it. I was talking to a good preacher friend of mine this week and uh, he got saved when he was only 17 years old. And he'd always heard about, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, his grandmother was of a, uh, of a different denomination. And she always said, well, you know, you got to leave it. And uh, he said that he had made up his mind that he wasn't going to get saved until he was sure that he could leave it. And uh, he said that when he went to church and he heard the gospel, he said he went forward and got saved. And uh, he said, well, I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Because I'm going to see if I can live it before I tell anybody. He said he got in his car and started home. He said he got to thinking about that. He said, well, I'm going to go over to my grandma's house and said, I'm going to tell her. So he knocked on the door. It was late at night, about 10 o'clock at night. His grandmother was all in the bed. And said she was an older lady. She came to the door. He said, Lord, have mercy. He said, what are you doing here at this time of night? He said, somebody hurt? He said, are you all right? He said, no, everything's fine, Grandma. He said, I just wanted to come by and tell you, I got religion tonight. He said, his grandma started shouting. <laughs> and uh, said, she shouted. He said, she is so tickled and so happy about that. And he said, he left her house and says, getting on about 11 o'clock. And he went to uh, his aunt's house. Knew she was a church going woman. Knocked on the door and said, she come to us. She's already in the bed. He said, Lord, help. us. said, what's wrong? What are you doing here? He said, well, he said, I just wanted to come by and tell you that I got religion tonight. <laughs> now, you know, see, people don't know, do they? You, if you get saved, you ain't getting a dose of religion. You're getting Jesus Christ to move into you and taking up his abode. He'll be a resident on the inside then. But, you know, he, he didn't know it, and people would just get saved. I didn't know any scripture when I got saved, not a bit. But that don't keep you from getting saved, does it? He said he expected his aunt to shout like his grandmother did. But instead of doing that, she said she just started crying. She wept a little bit, and she said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. See, people act, respond different in different ways, don't they? And so what I'm simply saying is, it's a wise word when you call upon the Lord, the Lord. He is the only one that can save you. You're wise to do that. Then it's a wonderful word. Notice, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, and let's all say this word together, shall be saved. saved. Wasn't that a good word? People laugh at it now. You ask somebody, are you saved? They'll say, from what? 
I said, well, it's going to take me a while to tell you all that I'm saved from. But what are we saved from? You know, I'm glad I got saved. When the Holy Spirit had thrown me overboard and I felt like that I was drowning in the sea of God's wrath and the Holy Spirit came by and he tossed me a life preserver to bring me to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was wonderful. I'm glad I got saved. I didn't just make a decision. Uh, Christ is born in me. The Holy Spirit took up his abode in me. I'm saved by God's grace. That's a good word. Wonderful word, the word saved. Saved from what? I'm saved from the penalty of sin, which was death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm saved from a guilty conscience. Hebrews 10 and verse number 2. There are things that I did in my past life that I am ashamed of, but they're under the blood. They're forgotten about. Another thing the old devil will do is he'll tell you that you know you've done all these bad things. You cannot be saved. You're too bad. I'm here to tell you you're not too bad to be saved. And when God forgives you, he saves you from a guilty conscience. He saves you from a life of sin. I want to tell you, you cannot keep going on the path that you're going and wind up well. And if you'll get saved, it'll save you a lot of heartache down the road. I think when God saves a little child, not only does he save a soul, but he saves a life as well. He saves you from a life of sorrow. I could tell you some heartbreaking stories of people that live in a life of total sorrow because they have rejected Christ. They do not know him. I remember years ago, I went to the funeral home. I had a first cousin who dropped dead at 49 years old of a heart attack. He went out on the back porch to pick up a piece of wood. And when he bent over, he just failed. He was dead. They had his, the receiving of friends and Marty and I, we hadn't been married long at the time, but we went to that funeral home and we went through uh, the line of my family who was there for my first cousin who had fallen dead suddenly with a heart attack. And so my dad was there. And uh, so after I went through the line, he pulled me over to the side. He said, I want to show you something. And so it was a large funeral home. And in the next across the hall, there was another family there visiting with their loved ones. And the last name was Alexander. And so he says, I want you to step across here. He said, I want you to see something. And so we went through there, just a small crowd of people. And I'm going to tell you something. You're talking about a rough-looking bunch. They were rough. We went by the casket, and in the casket laid a man who was in his mid-30s, he looked like he was 70 years old, had long stringy hair, a little stringy beard, and uh, had leather on. And I, I mean, you could tell by looking at him. And I looked at that man's face and I thought, you know what, that, that, there's something very unsettling about looking at that man. We get through the line, and I was somewhat familiar with the family, but this is what my dad told me. He said, that boy's grandfather said his wife took a shotgun and stuck it under his chin while he was asleep and blowed his brains out. The sheriff of the county came and asked the lady, said, did you do that? She said, I did. He said, bless your heart. He had been called to that home many times where that woman was beaten to a pulp and almost died. Listen to this, that man would bring girlfriends home, sleep in the bed where him and his marital bed, and make his wife get up the next morning and cook breakfast for the both of them. He wound up, his brains blowed all over the headboard. His son had his guts shot out with a 12-gauge shotgun and a liquor still. And this boy, the grandson, after all of that, died a horrible, horrible death. 
I want to say this. Sin has a consequence to it. It's not only you that it affects, take you to an early grave, but it'll have an effect on your children and your children's children. The next day they filled the coffin full of liquor and drugs and they buried him in a very obscure place where people couldn't even get to, had to haul him in there on the back of some kind of a machine. Now what I'm simply saying is this, God will save you from a life of sorrow. You think you can sow to the flesh all the way through life and not reap the, the guilt and the shame of that? You're fooling yourself. Sorrow that comes along with it. And then I'm saved from eternal punishment. Here the Bible says, For whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the Bible says in the book of the Revelation, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever is a word that goes all the way through the scriptures. I tell you this word of faith that we preach is a blessed word. It's good news from a far country if you'll receive it and believe on it. Standing to our feet. We need a spirit-filled preachers to teach us right from wrong. We need our old-fashioned seekers who'll pray all night long. We need some good gospel singing Help us go another mile. The church will triumph, oh Lord, and go home in a little while. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. When you're down in the valley, prayer is all I can do. But the Lord sends deliverance and strengthens you. Now if you're up on the mountain, See me struggling alone. Lift my name up to Jesus. Let's help each other make it whole. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of these trials, we'll hear Jesus call. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of this climb. 
It'll be worth it after all. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of these trials, we'll hear Jesus call. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of this climbing, it'll be worth it. Let's do that chorus one more time. One more time. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of these trials, we'll hear Jesus call. It'll be worth it after all, child. It'll be worth it after all. After all of these climbing, It'll be worth it after all. After all of this climbing, it'll be worth it after all.